Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask Nelda to come to the piano because she wasn't watching and getting my cue. This year. Good morning. I bet you knew it was me today. It's okay. It's good. What's a prop comic without props, right? A couple of things I want to say. If on the uh, Connect Center, which is just out here, we always have a stack of these. What this is, is the announcements that we've given for the week. So if you missed out on something, you didn't hear what they said, we said a wrong time, please hold us accountable because this is always right, <laughs> right? This has three or four sets of eyes, and sometimes when, when it comes out of our mouth, we're, there's so many other things in our head happening. So be sure and grab one of these if you missed it. There's also a stack of the QR codes to sponsor a, child, a, a student, which would be middle school and high school, to go to youth convention. And I will tell you, uh, you won't want them to miss that opportunity. Go ahead, Mom. <clears throat> because what happens when you get hundreds and thousands of students, ladies, men, doesn't matter. What happens when you get hundreds and thousands of people together in a room and they've paid money to be there and they've taken the time out of their schedule to step into an atmosphere, their expectation is already high. Don't tell me when you walk into the Chiefs game, you expect to see Patrick Mahomes and Travis Kelsey to put on a good show. You come in with that on the inside of you. And so what happens there is you're already ready. And everything, you're, you're viewing everything from a perspective of hope and excitement on the cusp of, I promise I won't fall off, I can see it. It's good, I can feel it. So it's important. It's important for us to put our students in that atmosphere. It's important because my ceiling is their floor. I can only take this church as far as the Lord asked Pastor Steve and I to take this church. And if we don't properly prepare our ceiling, their floor will be spongy and not worth work walking on and they'll have to build it from the ground up again. And Father, help us if that ever happens. So part of building a solid ceiling is sending them to places where they hear more than just us, where they hear more than just you. Does that ever happen to you sometimes when you're, you're telling your kids things and you're like, you know, I would tell my children all the time, you need to this, 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 and this. Now, I was a mean mom, I get it. I'm proud of that because... From the age of eight on, my children did their own laundry because I was not going to sift through the floor of and sea of stinky, smelly things in your bedroom. That is not my responsibility. My responsibility is to provide for you the clothes that you want to wear. And then what you do with it and how you care for it from there is totally up to you. And if you want to wear stinky, nasty clothes, that's on you because I showed you how to use the washer. I showed you how to use the dryer. I showed you that if you dry your jeans too often, they're going to look like this. <laughs> but the moment somebody else's mom said, you know, you probably should do your laundry, it was like earth shattering. The whole world got brighter because it sunk into their heart. So you can tell your children, live this way, love the Lord this way, read these scriptures as you should. But the Lord always sends that extra voice to come in and just solidify and give validation to everything that you have said. That's why it's important. Not because we want you to have full 24 hours without your children. That's just the icing on the cake. Right? Right? So that's all I have to say about that. The next thing is ladies. I know we talked about, can we put the slide back up for um, the women's rally? I'm really excited about this one because listen, we are gonna have fun. There are two things you need to know. One, next Sunday, there will be a QR code. Oh, I put it over there. There will be a QR code for you to register. It does not cost you anything, but I'm not gonna provide paint for 200 people and have 35 people in the room, right? So register yourself, register your friend. And I'm gonna tell you, the Holy Spirit has just been so powerful in this. We're gonna paint and we're gonna talk. And we're gonna learn from the word of God as we paint. And you think, oh my goodness, 
I am terrible at it. Listen, no one in this room is worse at arts and crafts than I am. I can put a paper flower together and it will look like my brand new seven day old great niece made it. It's terrible. It's not about what the picture looks like. It's about coming and hearing Rhonda say the words of God to you and then just letting your love for him come out. So register yourself, number one. Number two, we're gonna do one thing, one game, and it's called coffee mug swap. So you bring a coffee mug from your house. Don't spend money on this rally. You come, everything you're gonna get is free. So bring a coffee mug from your house because if you're anything like me, I have five shelves of coffee mugs that people have given me and I think I use about six of them. <clears throat> so find your favorite coffee mug. We're gonna do a swap. We're gonna love on each other. Don't miss out. And on the, on the Connect Center, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about what I experienced I know that some of you are familiar with Designed for Life. It is the women's conference that is put on through James River Church in Springfield, Missouri, actually Ozark, Missouri. And I want to encourage you, grab your girlfriends. We will not take a church group of ladies because you're amazing and you love things and I don't want to rent a van and buy a hotel and feed you and think about that because then I'm not getting anything either, right? Because I'll love you, I'm gonna say no. But Get your girlfriends. It is two weekends. You can choose which one you go to. One is in Springfield at the Great Southern Bank Arena. The other one is actually at the church. They are both amazing. There is not one that's better than the other. There's not one more advantageous than the other. They are exactly the same, except for when the people bring the spirit in the room. That's what makes it different. There's a QR code. So I have taped, I only have three. I borrowed Rainey's. So this is on the Connect Center. Come and see who's going to speak. Make plans 365 days from now to invest in your spiritual life. Moms, take your daughters. Five years old, six years old, I promise you, they will never experience a greater power than the power of God listening to 4,786 women singing, you are holy. There's nothing like it. Don't miss out. So there's a QR code on the back. Scan it. That is your registration. It is $75 cheaper until the 1st of November. Okay? I promise you, you won't want to you won't want to miss it. You don't want to miss out. You don't want to say make excuses. We're actually going to talk a lot about that today. I hate excuses. So let's pray. Actually, I want you to stand with me. I know we've been up and down, and Alan, it's so good to see you. Carolyn's brother is here all the way from Louisiana. We're thankful for you. We're praying for you. God is good. We're gonna sing a song, and Paige is gonna go ahead and put it on the, the screen. <clears throat> but I want us to prepare, because I have some things to say today. And they come from a deep place of love. And I need you to know that that's where they come from. So would you sing this with me and not just sing it because there's words up there, but sing it because you really want to hear what Jesus has to say to you today. Has nothing to do with what Amy's saying. Has everything to do with what Jesus is saying. So open my eyes, Lord. I want to see Jesus to reach out and touch him and say that I love him. Open my ears, Lord, and help me to is the cry of our heart this morning, Father. Jesus. Let your spirit reign and rule in this place. We bind the spirit of distraction and discouragement. 
We come against the spirit that would say, I don't need to listen, this is not for me. And we welcome the Holy Spirit to flip us over, turn us inside out today, that we will not be the same as when we came in. And all of God's children said, amen, amen. You can be seated. Thank you, Nelda. She is great because my brother's kids had a baby last Sunday, so she is great grandma again of girls, which is amazing because for a long time it's been only boys. So the frills and lace are just going places. <clears throat> I'm excited today. For a lot of years and months and weeks and days, oh, there's three, thank you. I have been your cheerleader, cheering you on, encouraging you. I like to encourage people. I like to send you texts randomly as the Lord puts you in my spirit at five o'clock in the morning. Most of the time it can wait till seven, but sometimes, I'm sorry. I'm your cheerleader. I'm the one that's, that's jumping up and down all the time, and I'm the one that says, you can do this, come on, come on, come on, come on. I believe in you. You are great. You are amazing. You can do everything that the Lord says for you to do. And I give this cheerful word. But today, I get to be your coach. And there's a big difference between the relationship of a cheerleader and a coach, right? We're closing out. In fact, on Thursday was day 40. If you were following along with us, some of you may have been a couple of days ahead or behind. Either way, we should be closing 40 days of Red Letter Challenge. And sometimes, as a team, as a ball team, when you spend the time together and everybody's doing the things and day 40 hits, you think, oh, yeah, I'm done. That was great. We're not done. You're not done. Because every good ball team, and let, let me just share with you, every good ball team, <laughs> I have a cold, so I, I really have a whole pharmacy sitting up here that you can't see, which is why I didn't hug your necks when you came in. You're welcome. But every good ball team always has in the spring something called spring training. Spring training training camp, and they isolate themselves, they become a team together, they get with each other, they learn the plays, the strategies, they do the stretching, they do the, the cardio training, they exercise their lungs, they're doing all the things so that the small interior muscles around their knees, their ankles, and their hips, sometimes even their shoulders and their elbows and their wrists, they're doing the things necessary, learning the small details of their team and their body so that when they come together for game time, they know what it feels like when it's a real pain or if it's just the annoying pain of the game. Right? All right, y'all are way too quiet. <laughs> I like chatter. So we've just finished spring training, fall training, right? We've just finished. And just because you read day 40 and maybe you read day 41, now is the time for us to, to gear up. Now you gotta lace your cleats a little tighter. Now you gotta tape up your ankles a little bit better. Now you gotta put that Bengay stuff and that Asper cream in all the places. Now you gotta make sure that your pads are nice and tight and they're protecting the innards. Because when you get hit and you will get hit, you have to protect the things that are the most necessary. So as your coach this morning, I'm getting ready to tell you something. And a coach would say this, get your head, say it again, get your head, yeah. You've gotta get your head in the game because this isn't for play. There is a real enemy, there is a real devil there is a real Satan, and he is way craftier than any of us. He has had decades, generations, and centuries to watch the behavior of humankind. He has had full access to the throne room of God, and he even said, hey, let me get to Job. Right? He is more crafty 
than anything you can ever dream up. And he knows the strategies. He knows the cute little plays. He can spot it when you're coming out of the pocket to throw a sidearm. He knows how to block that. What he doesn't bank on is for you, and now I'm going to switch from football to basketball. He doesn't bank on the fact that you're going to do the basics, that you're going to guard the lane, that you're going to block it out, that you're going to be able to, to move laterally, and you're going to be able to find and see all that he's going to do because you know the basics. You know the truth. You know what it takes. It takes being, forgiving, serving, giving, and going. We're all in the same. We all know the game plays. We know that when he says, and it's kind of funny, I'm back to football, just in case. So you know that I know the difference. When he, when he comes down and he, he backs up and he says, blue lady. He doesn't say that, but that's what it sounds like. Now you'll hear it today. <laughs> blue lady. And then he yells some other things. The team knows exactly what to do. They know when to shift. They know where to find the hole. They know how to get around the enemy that's coming at them full bore. Because their head is in the game. So we have learned the plays. We've read the playbook. We have been discipled by one another, whether in small groups of two or three, or large groups of, of, of life groups. We've even given you signs and signals. There was 40 days of videos on YouTube and Facebook. We have done all the things to prepare you for the season that God's bringing you into. And there's gonna be an enemy. There's gonna be an attack. And I need you to understand something. That not, I'm not gonna tell you to get your head in the game because it should already be there. But I'm going to tell you, you have to be in the room. You have to be in the room. What do you mean? So when we come to church on Sunday mornings, this is our huddle, right? Thank you. Like truly. I'm working on a lot of Tylenol cold and sinus right now, so you're going to have to cheer me up here. Know the playbook. When we come together on Sundays, this is the huddle. It's very easy to get distracted in the huddle. It's very easy to come in and say, oh, I don't know if my kid's going to be able to do this today. I hope they don't sing that really loud song today. I hope they don't, you know, da 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 da, fill in the blank. I really hope Sister Kathy Whitfield's here to make all the homemade cookies. Haven't had any breakfast. But I'm telling you, you need to be in the room. There were 12 disciples that followed Jesus everywhere he went. And in just a minute, and not, not just yet, Ms. Page, I may bounce back and forth, but I will help you. There were many times, and we're going to look at two of them specifically today, that they were with Jesus. They were occupying space with Jesus, but they weren't in the room. You can be in this room and be distracted by a thousand things. I was in a room of 4,000 women from Thursday to yesterday afternoon. And the, the way to be distracted is to look around. Because I promise you, they can hold themselves and they can uh, not have to excuse themselves for the bathroom for an entire movie or ball game. But the moment you say Jesus, and it's like their bladder lets loose. <laughs> and it's just trains and trains of ladies. And you're like, seriously? I know what you paid to get in here and, and you're willing to just walk away. I'm not missing a moment of it because I want everything. Some of us walk around in our life and in our life choices and we choose to do the things that make us happy, that give us joy, that put us above everything else because we're all about in the culture today, we are all about in the culture today, self-care. 
I love self-care. I get it. I need space. I need quiet. I need time to myself. Un unbelievable to you, I am an introvert. And I cherish the days when I don't have to say a single word. Except I love you, honey. Here's your coffee. <laughs> right? But we can get so distracted in our life that we can have and be in the space where Jesus is and still not be in the room and still not see and still not hear. We can walk past the Samaritan on the highway and still not be in the room even though I'm a leader at my church. I hold the door open and say, glad you're here. And we are. But you can occupy the space and still not be in the room. And you can let things of life crowd in the space of your mind and in the space of your heart. And you can let hurts and you can let pain, you can let tragedy, you can let uh, joy and triumph and victory. Those things are all part of life and who we are, but they should never be the distraction that keeps you from being in the room. Right? Right? So the first example this morning, and she's going to put it on the screen for me, is the woman with the issue of blood. Now, this conference, so this today is day seven of church services for me. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday morning, we were at a minister's renewal, so we were in six or 700 ministers just being refreshed, receiving a word from the Lord, not having to think about anything but just coming in and doing what you do on Sundays, just receive. It was beautiful, powerful. And then Thursday morning, I, we got up. Well, we, Rainy and I got up. And we drove back to Springfield. And we spent Thursday, Friday, Saturday in a room of thousands of women. And as the, the multiple speakers, I mean, it was just many, 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 many speakers. Every time they would get up and say, someone with this ailment, the Lord is going to heal you right now. Stand up. And so we saw hundreds of women freed from the spirit of anxiety. We saw hundreds of women freed from the spirit of pornography. We saw hundreds of women freed from a, a destitute and broken heart. And they left that place not the same. Because we decided to be in the room. And so many times I just kept hearing this in my head all the time that the woman with the issue of blood, Jesus had 12 disciples and he empowered them. He breathed on them and said, go out two by two and minister to these areas. And then they came back. And then this woman with an issue of blood says, on, Jesus was on his way. You should really write this down, by the way. Luke, can you see it? Luke 8, 43 to 48. So Jesus was uh, on his way and the crowds crushed against him. Now you kind of know what that looks like. You've watched Taylor Swift lead something. I mean, they're just everywhere. And I am not a fan, so I'm not endorsing. I'm just saying you know what that looks like, right? And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. In fact, it said uh, in another translation, there's a footnote that says she had been to doctors and spent every cent that she had. She had no money left. She was at the end. And in verse 44, she came up behind him. Who is him? Jesus. Yes. And touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. And Jesus stopped, and he said, who touched me? Who touched me? And the disciples are like, who didn't? Who didn't touch you? Do you see all the people in the room? He said, no, 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 no. Someone touched me, and the power left from me. Someone was in a crowd of people, and they were in the room because their situation led them to be so desperate that if all I can do is just touch the hem of his garment, that's all I can do. I'm not even supposed to be here. If they see me in this crowd, I'm going to die of stoning because I am unclean. But all I need is just to touch the hem of his garment. That's in the room. That's in the room. Yeah. And the disciples missed it until it was over. They didn't even see it because they were in the space but not in the room. Another example is in Mark chapter 2, blind Bartimaeus, I love this, 
When we were youth pastors a thousand years ago, we did things called human videos. And I'm going to tell you, if you want to test a youth pastor to the core of who they are, you put teenagers in the room and you try to teach them basically dance movements to a song to tell a story. You know what I'm saying? But, but this one, this particular story we told in a song called I Want to See. And so it says in Mark chapter 10, 46 to 52, write it down because I want you to look at it. Six days this week, I want you to look at it. Then he came to Jericho. Jesus is always walking. It's kind of like the Hobbit movies. They're always walking, always journeying. As Jesus and his disciples together with a large crowd were in the city, blind, a blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting on the roadside begging. When he heard Jesus of Nazareth. That was it. All he had to do was hear it. When he heard Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, son of David, have mercy on me. I want to see. So Jesus asked him, he said, um, well, the crowd, how funny is this? Shh, be quiet. Stop talking. That might be us, guys. That might be us saying, hey, shh. And somebody on the inside is already in the room that we should have already been in. And he says, Jesus stopped and said, come here. He said, Kevin, come here. Cheer up on your feet. He's calling you, they said. Throwing his cloak aside, and I won't do that because it's 100 degrees in here. And, and Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. And Jesus says to him, what do you want me to do for you? In a crowd of thousands on a dirty, dusty road, a man is sitting on the ground, probably leaned up against a, a structure or a tree of some sort with a mat that he's not ever left from because he can't unless he has somebody to lead him out. He's hollering and Jesus hears that. Son of David, have mercy on me. Who is it? Send him over here. What do you want? What do you want me to do for you? And he says, I want to see. I want to see. So then what happens? Go. Your faith has healed you. Your faith has healed you. Sometimes we're not in the room because we don't have faith. We don't want to get our hopes up. We don't want to say things like, I believe the Lord can heal me. I believe my son will be saved. I believe that my family will be whole again. I believe that as I obey in my finances, his is the cattle on the thousand hills and the thousand hills, and he will not see me begging for bread. That's your faith. It looks like this in, in Matthew. It's in Matthew 17, something or other. You can put it in the chat if you know. This is a mustard seed inside this tiny little ring. It says if you have the faith of a mustard seed, then you can tell this mountain to move from here to there. Right? That's being in the room. That's being aware of your circumstances. That's being in your prayer closet, on your living room, in your house, at your job, in your car, at your office, having the worship music playing, having the Bible playing, doesn't even matter. Being in the room means that you know the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, that you know him, that you feel his presence, that you hear his voice, that you see the things going, around, going on around you. Being in the room is not necessarily being in this room, although I think if you are not in this room, as we all gather together for our scheduled times, I think you're missing out. Because if you choose to stay home that day, something on the inside of you was supposed to deliver something into the room. All of us together. Right? Being in the room means you gotta be in the room. You have to get the distractions out of your mind. Distractions look a lot like, hmm, I'm not going to get into that. You know what a distraction is. You know what pulls your mind away. Facebook is a distraction. 
and it's a distraction for gossipy people. What's happening? I need to know. I have to know. Why isn't it happening to me? Why don't I look like that? Well, because you eat pizza rolls at 10 o'clock at night and drink a Coke, that's why. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? There are things in your life that are distractions that the strategy of the enemy, they're coming in full bore, right? They're, they're, they're what is it called? The, when they try to sack them, sack what's it called? When they push, they push the passer, like, Blitz. Blitz, thank you. Blitz. He's blitzing you. He knows your buttons. He knows that you like this or that. And he knows that if he can keep you in constant turmoil, make you feel like you're not enough or make you feel like, oh, Pastor Amy didn't smile at me. I didn't see her in the lobby. She, didn't, she wasn't happy with me today. If the, he knows if you can do that and keep it all stirred up in your head, you're not even going to pay attention today. Well, I wasn't out in the lobby because I don't want you to be sick. That's it. I love you enough to stay away. Right? Rainy come. The last example is the man who was let down in the roof. You know, his friends carried him. Come on ahead, honey. His friends carried him so desperately this morning. If I'd had more time, I would have had Lydia right here on this pallet, and we would have carried her in and lowered her down, but I was too afraid. You gotta be in the room. Yes. You gotta be in the room and, and the people around you have to be in the room too. You're not a lone ranger, you don't do things on your own. You have to surround yourself with people who are going to do what it takes and ruin their beautiful manicure that Pastor Steve men don't even notice. <laughs> I mean, if you missed that sermon, girls, you need to know, boys are not saying things like, ooh, look at the nails on that girl. <laughs> they, they, don't, they don't care. But you got to be around the right people. You have to surround yourself. If they're not lifting you up, they're pulling you down. There is no middle ground. If they're not holding up your arms, if they're not encouraging you, if they're not, then they're pulling you down and you cut them out. Not ugly, like, I will cut you. That's not it. <laughs> what you say is, I love you enough to say, I'm in a season and I need some space. When my season is over, I will let you know. And that's it. Right? Cool. So, um, all the way up. Okay. To your mouth. Okay. Okay. Believe it or not, I'm not much of a talker. I'll sing all day, talking in my thing. But, um, on the 1st of October, the Lord gave me this vision of the man who was dropped through the roof. And he told me, Rainy, that's you. Each person that has been speaking life into you has been pulling you farther and farther. Well, they're dropping me to the Lord, not pulling me down, you know what I mean? But bringing me closer and closer until I'm laying at the feet of Jesus. And he said, even though your body is not broken, your mind and your soul is. And praise God, this weekend I was healed from my anxiety. Yes. But before that, on Tuesday night, I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. <laughs> with the evidence of speaking in tongues. And that's, that's different, because I was raised Baptist, and you know we didn't do that. <laughs> it matters that you're in the room, because for 25 years, I wasn't. And I had no idea until the Lord showed me this. And even then, I was like, oh, it's about healing. That's perfect. It's about, you know, how important your circle is, and it is. It is, but how can you not be in... I wasn't in the room until I was laying at the feet of Jesus. And now, healed, I can run to him. Yeah. 
Yeah. Amen. So brave. So brave. So brave. Now listen, it's, it's not easy to, to come and say those kinds of things. But I'm telling you, when you choose to be in the room, the Holy Spirit will come. He will meet you right where you are. Right? There's, there's nothing that can hold you back when you've experienced the healing power of the Holy Spirit. When you've created a relationship with the Holy Spirit. Totally different. So be intentional, guys. Because one rope tied wrong, one rope tied lazy, one rope not as secure as the others, and the whole thing, well, snap, <laughs> falls. Right? One pillar in your life not right, one offense that you hold on to, one grievance you have, one pain you can never let go of, one thought that you are, you are it, and there is none like you. I made myself this man. I did it. Well, it's sweet that you think that, but no, you didn't. The Lord gave you that skill. The Lord gave you that favor. And you should turn around and give it back to him. Because then he can do more with what you give him than you will ever do with what you do for yourself. Right? The last thing we're going to talk about this morning. Acts chapter 1. All of them are together in the upper room, right? Here we go, another large crowd. And this, this says Acts chapter 2, but I'm going to talk about Acts chapter 1. So you can leave it there. It's totally fine. They were all together in one accord, not the Honda, but the room, the spirit, right? They were in the room. They were praising. They were worshiping. They were encouraging one another. They were in there for 10 days, so I'm sure they smelled amazing. I'm sure they were hungry. I'm sure the distractions could have been so many that we don't have enough fingers and toes in the room, but they chose to be in the room. When they chose to be in the room together, the Holy Spirit, what sounded like a mighty, violent wind, blows through the room, and what looked like tongues of fire comes down and rests on their head, and they begin to speak in languages that they did not even know. In fact, isolated from this, they spoke in a language in languages that people on the ground during Passover coming in, why, they're telling me about Jesus in my language. In fact, they're so loud and they're so forceful and they're so in the room that the first thing they say is, well, I think these people are drunk. Well, they might act like it. And it is the spirit. But they're going to remember everything after it. And they will never be the same again. And so after they've had this powerful encounter with God, go ahead, Paige, you're doing a great job, honey. The beggar at the gate beautiful in Acts chapter three, write it down. After they've had the spirit of God, one day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at three in the afternoon. And now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple called beautiful or the temple gate. When he was put where he was put every day to beg from those going in. This was his job. This is how he lived. It was his whole life. It's the only thing he'd ever done, right? When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. And Peter says, in the room, full of the Holy Spirit, he says, you know, I don't have any money. But what I have, I'm gonna give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. Talk about being in the room. Talk about being in the room so full of the power of an almighty God that when your friends text you and say, hey, I can't do this or this or this today because I'm sick, and you say, you know what? No way. You are healed in Jesus' name, and that nasty cold and all of its stuff is going to go far, far away, and I just received that in Jesus' name. Thank you for praying that, but I'm still taking a nap today. <laughs> Be in the room. Don't just occupy the chair, be in the room. 
Don't just occupy the seat in the sofa. Be in the room. Engage in the spirit. Tell the Father you're ready for whatever he has for you. Be in the room. If you're not going to be in the room, then why are you here? If you're not going to give him everything that you are, your thoughts, your finances, your family. Listen, I watched a young lady this weekend. I'm going to cry. I watched a young lady who chose to live an alternative lifestyle. Just about to get married to another lady. And they laid hands on her because she said, I want freedom. I want to be free. And no one said, you're living in sin. She already knew because she was in the room. And everybody in the room was in the room. And they prayed for her and her entire countenance changed. She was not the same person. She was set free from the lies of the enemy that said, oh, you're always going to be this way. No, you're not. You are a blood-bought blood bought child of the king. You are wholly created in his image. Male and female, he created them. That gives me hope that my prodigal is going to come home. And he's going to be the man that God created him to be. And he's going to serve the kingdom of God all of the days of his life. But I have to let God do it. I can't. I can't be the pushy one in the room that says, you need this, you need this, you need this. I just have to be the one that's in the room and listening to the Spirit. Letting him lead my words. I don't have money to give you. I don't have resources to put at your feet. But what I have is an everlasting God and I'm going to give it to you. So in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up. Walk out of your circumstance. You are the only one keeping you there. You are the only one that's blocking the spirit from doing what he wants to do in your life. It's you. It's you. It's not me. It's not the church. It's not the church people. I read a meme um, the other day, and it said, if you were hurt by the church, God is not the church. God is not the church. We are flawed individuals. We're not always nice. And apparently, I don't cut grass very well. <laughs> but what I have, I give to you. As your coach, I'm telling you this morning, be in the room. You know the place. You know the strategies. You know how to serve. You know you're supposed to give. You know you're supposed to go. You know you're supposed to share your testimony. Do you know this? Let me say this to you. Revelation 19.10. It's not on the screen. Write it down. Revelation 19.10 says, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. What does that mean? The testimony of Jesus says this. I am healed I am saved, I am whole. The testimony of Jesus says he is my Lord and my Savior. I receive the sacrifice that he made. And not only that, I want to tell the other people about it. So when you give your testimony, you are creating a spirit of prophecy and opening up the heavens for that to happen to other people. If you hold it on the inside of you, then that's it. That's as far as it goes. And we want heaven as it is on earth. No, we want I said it backwards, but you know what I meant. Switch it around. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The more you give God glory, the more you give him credit, the more you tell the world all the things that he's doing for you, even if it's silly. I found one packet of throat coat tea, and I thanked him this morning because I needed it. The spirit of your testimony is the spirit of prophecy and it opens up the arena for other people to believe and it helps them be in the room. Look at your neighbor and say, please be in the room. Like really, say it. Please be in the room. I need you to be in the room because someday the Lord's going to give you a word that is going to heal a place on the inside of me and then I can speak out and say, this is what the Lord did. It is not the microphone 
That is the word of God. It is what's living on the inside of you. Be in the room. Be in your prayer closet. Be in your word. Know the plays. Do the things. Now is game time. We just finished training camp. Now is game time. And I'm fixing to blow my whistle. Because when the trumpet sounds, you don't get to play anymore. That's the end. And I don't want to be found lost. I don't want my pile of works, even though we don't do things for works. I don't want the things that, I, that the Lord asked me to do. I don't want you to have to cover my gap. Because if I keep telling the Lord no, and I keep telling the Lord no, he's going to find somebody else. And then I'm accountable for all the no. What did you do? Be in the room. Stand. Band is coming. Believe it or not. Was it Thursday or Friday, Steve? I don't remember when I text you. I think it was Thursday. It could have been Friday. I don't know. I've been in a lot of church. And they started singing this song. And the song, as the song's going on, in about seven minutes, I wrote, I wrote the entire sermon. This is what the Father would say to us. And then we're going to worship. I'm going to read this, and then I'm going to invite you to come. Just don't trip over this, please. And the Father would say, as I was writing on Friday night, stop doing and start being. Be in the room. Stop figuring out what you think you need to see and do. Be in the room. In the room, there's holiness, there's peace, there's wholeness, there's resurrection, there's healing, there's unity, there's forgiveness of sins, there's restoration, there's redemption. He is in the room. Be in the room. Be in the room. Host his presence. Be a conduit of the presence of God. Don't be distracted. Stop coming with an agenda. Be in the room. No preconceived ideas. Don't think you're more spiritual than you are. You're not. God talks to everybody. He doesn't just talk to you. He talks to everybody. And he talks to each of us differently. He is restructuring. He is restructuring the way you think, feel, and act. He is the only one that can do that. If anybody else tries, it's behavior modification. But you have to be in the room to hear the voice of God. So the altar call is simple. What we're going to do is, first of all, the first people to come, if you don't know Jesus, or you walked away from Jesus, or you, you had a form of Jesus, but you don't really know him, and you want to know him, then you should come. You should come and stand across the front, and our prayer team people will come and pray for you. The next group of people, so if you need salvation, if you need Jesus, come. The next group of people is going to be, Amy, I have occupied space, but I've not been in the room. I need to be in the room. And I want you to come. Well, why do I have to come to the front? Because if you don't, then you will always think you can get away with it. When the Spirit of God speaks to you and your heart's beating in your chest and you're sweating when it's in the normal temperature, not in the sauna that we have today. When you're sweating from the Spirit of God and you choose to stay in your seat, that says, I don't need help. That, my friend, is pride and rebellion, and that's a root of the enemy. We all need help. I answered every stinking altar call in the last seven days. I need help. It's a heavy weight. There's 137 people in this room. And your pastor and myself and the staff, we bear the spiritual burden of that. That's not just like fun and easy. That's heavy. I need help. So don't have pride. Pride is not in the room. The spirit is in the room. God is in the room. And they're going to start this song. And we're going to worship. And if you need Jesus, come. If you need to be in the room, you need to activate yourself in the room, come. I promise you, when you engage in the room, you'll be filled with the Holy Spirit, with the evidence of speaking in tongues. You'll be healed. Someone will have a word of knowledge for you. Those are the things. Those are the gifts God gives us when we choose to be in the room. 
If you're just going to access the space, then okay. I'm sorry. I want to be in the room. I want to be in the room. Would you come? Go ahead. Would you come this morning? Be in the room with me. Let Jesus heal the dark, hard, awful places in your heart that you think you have to hide and hold on to. Thank you, Father. May the darkness now has ended in the kingdom of light. In the kingdom of light, forever under your dominion. You're the king of my life, the king of my life. Jesus. 
Jesus, you reign above it all. The Lord would cry this morning to all of his people who come in faith. My son has done it all. All that you face, all that you fear, my son has defeated the works of the enemy. I ask one thing of my people. Come and believe the work that I require of you is believe in the works of my son Jesus. Trust and believe. Come Thank you, Jesus. in repentance. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. When the Lord speaks, I think it always warrants a response. And the Lord told us this morning, He paid the price. He did it all. And just want to give opportunity one more time in keeping with the message that the Lord just gave to us is the only proper response we come in the presence of the Lord is to repent. But if you're here this morning and say, I don't know Jesus as my Savior, that I'm ready to come give Him my heart, my life, die to self and be resurrected into His presence. If that's you this morning, would you just allow us to pray with you? Again, it doesn't matter if it's the first time or, man, you've walked away from the Lord and he's saying, hey, come back. Would you come? Just going to give you opportunity if the Lord's speaking to your heart this morning. Anyone before we, before we move on? Anyone? Last time I'm going to ask. Amen. Amen. There's just one thing that, uh, do you have anything? Yeah, can I give you a testimony? So there were two evening services and Thursday night. They're giving the altar call and they say, turn to your neighbor. Say, if you need to go respond to Jesus, I will go with you. If you want me to walk down the aisle and pray with you, I will. So there was a beautiful lady sitting next to me, and in fact, she sat next to me both nights. It was crazy. And I looked at her and I said, if you want to go, I will go with you. And she looked at me, she's like, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. I said, okay, but if you change your mind, you let me know. So Friday night comes, and here she is again, beautiful. And they didn't give that option. If you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, if you want to make a life-changing decision, you just come now. And they didn't give the option to ask your neighbor to come down. So I'm just praying, and my hands raised. And this time, I mean, she might weigh 90 pounds, soaking wet. She says, she grabs my hand out of the air. And she said, take me now. Take me down there now. Don't make me go by myself. Take me down there now. And she comes to the front, and she just melts in the presence of God. Don't say no too many times, guys. If 
you need to respond to what Jesus said today through the word of knowledge and the word of, of wisdom, if you need to respond to that, come now. Now is the time. You may never get this opportunity again. Come now. Come now. Amen. I, uh, just one thing that for several minutes I just have felt like I need to say and then we're going to close. Um, Amy referenced the upper room and when they were in one accord in that spiritual unity and the 120 were filled with the Holy Spirit. Scripture tells us that Jesus presented himself after the resurrection to over 500 people. So over 500 put their eyes on the resurrected Jesus. I'm going to propose to you, and it is not in Scripture, so let's not build a theology around it, but I think it's a pretty solid assumption. Many of that 500 went into the upper room on day number one. Jesus told them, go and wait. After 10 days when the Holy Spirit fell, out of however many went in, 120 is what was left. Now you and I both know human nature, don't we? 100% of the people are not going to wait 10 days for it. Amy talked about the, the four friends that lowered their paralyzed friend to the feet of Jesus. Those are some committed friends. Most would have turned around and been like, sorry, we can't get you in the house. I wonder, in the upper room, how many were praying and their buddies were next to them. Hey, it's been three days. I ain't got nothing. Let's go. Let's get out of here. Day two, a couple left. Day three, some left. Day four, I guarantee you some left. Day five, some were like, man, it's almost a week, I'm out. Can I tell you who you hang around with matters? Who is speaking into your life matters. And there are those that you have in your circle that do not belong there. They can be friends, but how many know we have our inner circle and those are people who have earned the right to be there, that have spoken into your life, that have your best interest in mind and they're the ones that they're gonna, you're gonna do life with that are gonna help you grow and become who God wants you to be. Even people who laid their eyes on Jesus after his resurrection, some of them bailed and they took people with them. And there's some of you in this room today that as I'm saying this, you know faces, names that the Holy Spirit is saying, they don't belong in your inner circle. You can love them. You can minister to them, but you know when you get in their circle, you go the wrong way. And that's hard, I know. It's hard. But can we just, as we close, if the Holy Spirit is speaking to you on that, and I just feel like we're just going to pray. I'm not going to ask you to come forward. But if the Holy Spirit is speaking to you along those lines, and you're like, man, I, I, I know that is me. And I know the Holy Spirit is speaking to me. Can you just lift up your hand. Don't point at someone if they're in the room that don't belong in your circle. Amen. Keep your hand up. Just keep it up. Amen. We have a few hands that are up. Can we just, as we close, can somebody be with each person that has their hand up? Keep it up for just a minute. Amen. Over here we have a couple. Ladies, if you'll go over here and just come around these. We just want to pray that God will give them the strength Right here is one. Back in the back. Keep your hand up, Jerry. If one of our men will go back there with Jerry. 
we just want to agree with him. God will give us the strength. Amen. And maybe you didn't want to raise your hand. That's fine. God knows your heart. But can we just pray for these as we close today? Just ask that God would give us the strength to surround ourselves with the kind of people who are going to lift us up and lower us to the feet of Jesus if need be. Lord, God, we thank you for your faithfulness, your goodness. God, that you of all, Lord, God, you are a friend, it tells us in Scripture, that sticks closer than a brother. And God, we want to be those, Lord God, that are a support to our friends, to those around us, Lord, that God was, we're in other people's inner circle, that God, we are constantly bringing them closer to the feet of Jesus. And Lord, that we in turn would, would want to be those that are, 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 are surrounding ourselves with people who are leading us to the feet of Jesus. God, you love us, and God, you give us what we need when we need it, Lord. And I pray for these who have been so bold as to lift their hands. God, that they would have the courage, Lord, to, to step forward with some relationships and say, you know, it's, it's not for this season. It's not for right now. And God, we still love people. We still value them. But Lord, sometimes, God, we have to draw boundaries. And so, Lord, we just ask today for the courage, the strength to be led by your spirit. And God, that through those things, Lord, as we're led by you, that God, we just grow nearer to you. We thank you for your faithfulness, for your goodness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to thank you for coming this morning. Thank you, Amy, for, uh, I think, a very timely message. Um, and that we just uh, take this word with us. If you need to continue praying this morning in the room, uh, find a place to pray. Um, but we're going to dismiss. Be back Wednesday night at 6.30. Our youth meet at 6.30. We have kids uh, and then adult service and, and we have prayer time in here at 6 30. Um, just come expecting the presence of the Lord. God is is stirring and the presence of God is is, is beginning to increase in our midst and, and and it's exciting to see what God has not just done but what he's going to do. Amen. That we come with an expectation. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week and we will see you Wednesday night 6 30 and um don't, if you're first time, take your uh, Connect card out to the Connect Center. Just want to say thank you for coming. God bless you.